This video series is funded by Jewish Hospital Foundation, Norton Healthcare, and the United States Surgical Corporation. This tape describes the musculoskeletal system of the trunk. We'll look at the trunk in four sections. In this first section, we'll look at the spine and the spinal cord. In the following sections, we'll look at the thorax, the abdomen, and the pelvis. The spine is known in anatomy as the vertebral column or spinal column. In looking at it, we'll look first at the bones, then at the structures that hold the bones together, then at the main muscles which move it. After that, we'll add the spinal cord and the spinal nerves to the picture. Here's the vertebral column. It consists of 24 separate vertebrae, the sacrum, and the coccyx. There are seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae and 5 lumbar vertebrae. The sacrum consists of 5 vertebral segments fused together. The coccyx, or vestigial tail, consists of 3 or 4 tiny segments. The highest cervical vertebra articulates with the skull. The thoracic vertebrae articulate with the ribs and the sacrum articulates with the two innominate bones to form the pelvis. When seen from in front, the spine appears straight. But when we look at it from the side, we see that it's markedly curved. The lower cervical vertebrae form a forward curve, the thoracic vertebrae form a backward curve, the lumbar vertebrae curve forward again, and the sacrum curves sharply backward. These pieces of material represent the intervertebral discs, which we'll be looking at shortly. The vertebrae of each region are numbered from above down. Instead of using the words cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, we often just use the letters C, T, L, and S. For example, we'd call the fourth lumbar vertebra the L4 vertebra. There are marked differences between vertebrae of different regions but they all have some basic features in common. We'll look at a typical thoracic vertebra to see what these features are. In front, this cylindrical mass of bone, the body of the vertebra, supports the weight of everything that's above it. Behind, there's a set of bony plates and projections which serve three functions, to protect the spinal cord, to give attachment to muscles and ligaments, and to articulate with the adjoining vertebrae. This arch of bone, the neural arch, encloses the spinal cord. The space that's surrounded by the arch and the back of the body is called the vertebral foramen. The series of vertebral foramina create the tubular space that contains the spinal cord. The space is called the vertebral canal. This part of the neural arch is called the lamina, this part is the pedicle. There's a small notch in the upper edge of the pedicle and a larger notch in the lower edge. Together, the notches above and below form this opening on each side, the intervertebral foramen. 
a spinal nerve emerges through each intervertebral foramen. Arising from the neural arch are three large bony projections called processes. A spinous process in the midline, a transverse process on each side. Also arising from the neural arch are four articular processes, two above and two below. The lower ones face forward, the upper ones face backward. The articular processes of adjoining vertebrae interlock, forming a pair of synovial joints which permit movement between adjoining vertebrae. Now that we've looked at one vertebra, let's look at the specialized and different features of vertebrae from the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar parts of the spine. Here's a typical cervical vertebra, the fourth one. The body is small. The upper surface of the body is curved, somewhat in the shape of a saddle. The lower surface has the same curvature in reverse. The vertebral foramen is large and triangular. The neural arch is formed mainly by the two straight laminae. The pedicles are very short. The spinous process is short and ends in a double point. The upper articular facets face upward and inward. The lower ones face downward and forward. The mass of bone between the articular facets is called the articular pillar. The transverse processes arise from the side of the body and also from here on the articular pillar. The transverse process of a cervical vertebra has a hole in it, the transverse foramen, through which the vertebral artery passes. The transverse process is shaped like a gutter pointing downwards. It ends in two tubercles, an anterior and a posterior, where the scalene muscles attach. Of the seven cervical vertebrae, the first two which are called the atlas and the axis, differ from the others in several ways. We'll see them in detail in volume four of this atlas. The seventh cervical vertebra also differs from the others in that it has a long spinous process, ending in a single point, which forms this small prominence on the back of the neck. The cervical vertebrae form the most mobile part of the spine, partly because of the curved shape of their bodies which makes flexion and extension easy, and partly because of the shallow slope of their articular processes, which makes lateral flexion easy. The movements that can occur in the cervical spine are forward flexion, extension, and lateral flexion to one side or the other. Rotation also occurs in the neck. Almost all of it happens at the specialized joints between the atlas and the axis vertebrae, which we'll look at in the tape on the head and neck, volume four of this atlas. In that tape, we'll also look at the way the atlas vertebra articulates with the bone that forms the underside of the skull the occipital bone. The joints between the atlas and the occipital bone are called the atlanto-occipital joints. Next, we'll look at the special features of the thoracic vertebrae. The bodies of the thoracic vertebrae become progressively more massive from above down, as they do from the top to the bottom of the vertebral column. Each of the thoracic vertebrae articulates with a pair of ribs. On each side, the vertebra articulates with the rib at two points. Here, at the end of the transverse process, and here, where the pedicle meets the body. We'll be looking at the ribs in the second section of this tape. 
the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae point sideways, the spinous processes point downwards, each one overlapping the one below. The articular processes are almost vertical. The upper ones face almost straight backwards, the lower ones face forwards. There's only a little movement between thoracic vertebrae, partly because of the presence of the ribs and partly because of the way the spinous processes are arranged. The movements that are possible are small amounts of forward flexion, lateral flexion, and perhaps surprisingly, rotation. Now, we'll take a look at a lumbar vertebra. The body is massive. The transverse processes are small. The spinous process is broad and points almost straight backwards. The upper articular processes of lumbar vertebrae face inward. The lower ones face outward. Because of this arrangement, there's almost no rotation between lumbar vertebrae. The movements that can occur in the lumbar spine are flexion, extension, and lateral flexion to either side. Lastly, we'll look at the sacrum. Besides being the lowest part of the spine, the sacrum is also an important part of the pelvis. Here's the sacrum together with the coccyx. The sacrum is formed by five vertebrae fused together. From top to bottom, it has a marked backward curve. When we're standing upright, the sacrum is oriented just as we see it here. The upper part of this backward-facing dorsal surface is angled at about 45 degrees to the vertical. The upper part of this forward-facing pelvic surface is more nearly horizontal than vertical. On the dorsal surface, there are two articular processes for the fifth lumbar vertebra. The lowest intervertebral disc is quite wedge-shaped. Its shape accounts in part for the very marked curvature of the spine between the fourth lumbar vertebra and the sacrum. The most anterior point on the sacrum is called the sacral promontory. The vertebral canal continues down the back of the sacrum. From within the vertebral canal, the anterior rami of the spinal nerves, S1 to S4, emerge from these pelvic sacral foramina. The posterior rami emerge from these dorsal sacral foramina. The vertebral canal ends at this opening, the sacral hiatus, that's shaped like an upside-down V. This curved auricular surface articulates on each side with the upper part of the innominate bone, or hip bone, to form the pelvis. The joints between the sacrum and the hip bones are the sacroiliac joints. These joints permit almost no movement. The broad ridge on each hip bone adjoining the sacrum is the iliac crest. It's an important muscle attachment, as we'll see shortly. We'll be looking at the hip bone in more detail in the last section of this tape. For now, we'll return to the spine. Now that we've looked at the dry bones of the vertebral column, let's look at the structures that hold the bones together and that enable them to move. We'll look first at the intervertebral discs, then at the ligaments of the vertebral column, then at the posterior joints. These structures are arranged in a similar way from the top of the spine to the bottom. We'll be looking at all of them in the lumbar region. Here's an intervertebral disc. The disc is a massive pad of fibrocartilage that's firmly attached to the vertebral body above and below, all the way around the circumference.
If we cut through a disk and look at it from above, we see that it's made of concentric layers of material. The disk consists of an outer ring of tough fibrocartilage called the annulus fibrosus and a soft center of almost liquid material called the nucleus pulposus. The disk is solid enough to transmit the weight of the body and it's flexible enough to permit movement between the vertebrae. The side of the intervertebral disc forms the anterior margin of the intervertebral foramen, through which the spinal nerve emerges. The vertebrae are also held together by ligaments. Some of these go from vertebra to vertebra, some run the length of the spine. Starting at the back, we'll look at the ligaments which hold the spinous processes together, the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments. Then we'll look at the ligament that holds the laminae together, the ligamentum flavum. Then we'll look at the two ligaments which help to hold the bodies together, the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. First, the interspinous ligaments. Here they are. They run from the lower edge of one spinous process to the upper edge of the next one. Now we'll add the supraspinous ligament to the picture. The supraspinous ligament merges with the interspinous ligaments. It runs the whole length of the vertebral column, connecting the tips of the spinous processes. The supraspinous ligament serves as a midline attachment for some important muscles, as we'll see later. These ligaments help to limit flexion of the spine. The structure, or structures, that chiefly limit flexion of the vertebral column is the series of short ligaments that hold the laminae together, which are known collectively as the ligamentum flavum. The ligamentum flavum lies on the front of the laminae. To see it, we'll cut through the pedicles of all the vertebrae along this line and look at the laminae from the inside. Here's the ligamentum flavum. It goes from one lamina to the next, all the way down the spine. Here, where it's been cut through, we can see how thick it is. The ligamentum flavum is made of yellowish fibroelastic tissue, hence its name, which means yellow ligament. Next, we'll look at the two ligaments which hold the vertebral bodies together, the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. The anterior is the stronger of the two. Here it is. The anterior longitudinal ligament covers the front and sides of the vertebral bodies. It runs the whole length of the vertebral column. We'll cut through it along this line to see it better. The anterior longitudinal ligament is thick and strong. It's attached to the upper and lower edges of each vertebral body. It limits extension of the spine. In extension, the tightness of the anterior longitudinal ligament helps to prevent backward and forward movement of the vertebral bodies relative to each other. The posterior longitudinal ligament runs along the back of the vertebral bodies. To see it, we'll divide the pedicles along this line again and look at the bodies by themselves. Here's the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's narrow where it overlies each body, and it widens out to cover the back of each disc. The posterior longitudinal ligament helps in a small way to limit flexion of the vertebral column. Each vertebra is attached to its neighbors not only by the intervertebral discs and the ligaments that we've seen, but also by the joints between the articular processes, the posterior joints. Each posterior joint is surrounded by a capsular ligament, which is loose enough to permit the small amount of movement that occurs between any two vertebrae. The capsular ligament has no great strength, but the articular processes themselves are strong. Because the upper ones face forward and the lower ones backward, the articular processes prevent the vertebra above from slipping forward relative to the vertebra below. Now that we've looked at the vertebrae and at the structures that hold them together, we're almost ready to move on to look at the principal muscles of the vertebral column.
Before we do that, let's briefly review what we've seen so far. If you'd like to use the following review to test yourself, turn off the sound and name the structures as they're shown. Here's a cervical vertebra, a thoracic vertebra, and a lumbar vertebra. Here are the body, the vertebral canal, the pedicle, the lamina, the transverse processes, the spinous process, the articular processes, and the intervertebral foramen. In the cervical vertebra, here's the anterior tubercle and the posterior tubercle of the transverse process, and here's the transverse foramen. Here's the sacrum, the coccyx, the pelvic sacral foramina, the dorsal sacral foramina, and the sacral hiatus. Here's an intervertebral disc, the annulus fibrosus, and the nucleus pulposus. Here are the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments, the ligamentum flavum, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and the anterior longitudinal ligament. Now we'll look at the muscles. Most movements of the vertebral column are produced by an extensive set of muscles that run all the way along the back of the spine. They're known collectively as the paravertebral muscles. The highest of them are attached to the base of the skull. The lowest ones arise from the sacrum and iliac crest. Some in between are attached to the backs of the ribs and many are attached to the transverse and spinous processes of the vertebrae. We'll build up our picture of these muscles from the inside to the outside. This is a dissection of the mid-thoracic region. On the left side, all the paravertebral muscles are in place, partly hidden beneath a covering layer of fascia. On the right side, all the paravertebral muscles have been removed. We're not concerned at present with these outlying muscles, the levators and the intercostals. Now, we'll add the paravertebral muscles to the picture starting with the ones that lie deepest, the short and long rotator muscles. Each short rotator goes from a transverse process to the base of the spinous process of the vertebra above. Each long rotator goes to the same point on the next vertebra but one. The rotators are overlaid by this series of more obliquely running strips of muscle, which together form one long muscle the multifidus muscle. Each segment of the multifidus arises from a transverse process and inserts on the sides of the spinous processes two to four vertebrae above. The rotators and the multifidus extend the whole length of the spine. Their action is to produce rotation of the upper part of the spine towards the opposite side. These deep rotating muscles are overlaid by much larger muscles. To get a picture of these remaining paravertebral muscles, we'll divide them into a lower group, the long muscles of the lumbar and thoracic regions, and an upper group, the long muscles of the back of the neck. The two groups overlap. We'll look at the lower group first. They're known collectively as the erector spiny muscles. They form a large mass of muscle extending all the way from the sacrum to the upper part of the thorax. At their origins, they're joined together. Passing upward, they separate out into three somewhat distinct muscles, the spinalis, the longissimus thoracis, and the iliocostalis lumborum. The erector spiny muscles arise from this massive common tendon of origin, which is attached to the spinous processes of the lumbar vertebrae, to the back of the sacrum, and to the iliac crest.
spinalis inserts onto the spinous processes of the upper thoracic vertebrae. Longissimus thoracis inserts on the lower nine ribs and the adjoining transverse processes. Iliocostalis lamborum inserts further out on the lower six ribs. The erector spinae muscles are important in keeping the body upright. The action that they have depends on whether they contract on both sides at once or on one side only. When they contract on one side only, they produce lateral flexion of the spine to one side or the other. When they contract on both sides at once, their action produces extension of the lumbar and thoracic spine, straightening our back as we stand up from a stooping position and keeping it straight as we lean forward. The action of the erector spinae group is counteracted by muscles of the abdominal wall, which we'll see later in this tape. Above the erector spinae muscles and overlapping with them are the long muscles of the back of the neck, which we'll look at just briefly at this point. They're the obliquely running splenius and longissimus muscles, and beneath them, the vertically running semispinalis. Here's its upper end. We'll look at the muscles of the neck in a lot more detail in volume four of this atlas. Now we'll move on to look at the vitally important contents of the vertebral canal, the spinal cord, the spinal nerves, and the protective layers of tissue that surround them. We'll look first at a cross-sectional view of the vertebral canal. This is a cut through the sixth thoracic vertebra. Here's the spinal cord. It only partway fills the vertebral canal. On each side, there are two lines of nerve filaments, one arising from the ventral aspect and one from the dorsal aspect of the cord. These filaments form the spinal nerves, as we'll see in a minute. The spinal cord lies within this strong protective layer, the dura. The dura is lined on the inside by a loosely attached membrane, the arachnoid. The cord is covered on the outside by a firmly attached membrane, the pia. The space between the arachnoid and the pia is called the subarachnoid space. In life, it's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The space between the dura and the wall of the vertebral canal is called the epidural space. It's filled with fat, loose connective tissue, and blood vessels. To see the contents of the vertebral canal from end to end, we'll take a look from behind at a dissection in which all the laminae have been divided along these lines and removed. Here's the sacrum. Here's the base of the skull. The tissues that occupy the epidural space have been removed to give us a clear look at the dura. This is the dura. The sleeve of dura is called the dural sac. It's open at the top end and closed at the bottom. Here, at the base of the skull, the dural sac passes through the foramen magnum becoming continuous with the layer of dura that surrounds the brain. At the bottom end, within the vertebral canal of the sacrum, the dural sac tapers down to a point at the level of the second sacral segment. To look at the spinal cord, we'll divide the dura in the midline and lay it aside. Here's the spinal cord. In the early embryo, the spinal cord extends the whole length of the vertebral column. But as development progresses, the vertebral column grows much more rapidly than the cord. The cord ends up filling only the upper two-thirds of the vertebral canal. The lower end of the cord, in the adult, is at the level of the first lumbar vertebra. Let's see some more details. 
These are nerve roots. We'll look at them in a minute. The cord is attached to the dura by a series of fine triangular ligaments, the denticulate ligaments. To see how the spinal nerves arise, we'll go up to the cervical region. The denticulate ligaments have been divided. Each spinal nerve arises from a small bundle of dorsal filaments, which unite to form the dorsal sensory root of the nerve, and a similar bundle of ventral filaments, which unite to form the ventral motor root. In the cervical region, the nerve roots follow a slightly oblique downward course. In the thoracic region, their course becomes more oblique. Here, right at the lower end of the spinal cord, this continuous line of nerve filaments gives rise to a large number of nerve roots, which run vertically downwards, almost hiding the very end of the cord, which is here. Below this point, the dural sac is occupied not by the cord, but by this leash of vertically running lumbar and sacral nerve roots, the corda equina. The nerve roots leave the vertebral canal, two at a time, all the way down to the lower end of the sacrum. Let's follow the course of one spinal nerve as it passes from inside the subarachnoid space to its emergence from the intervertebral foramen. To see this, we'll look at the cervical spine in a dissection in which all the surrounding muscles have been removed and in which the laminae have also been removed along these lines as in the previous dissection. Here are the roots of the nerve, leaving the dural sac. Here's the nerve, emerging from the intervertebral foramen. To see the whole course of the nerve, we need to remove this part of the vertebra. Here's the dorsal root of the nerve. Here's the ventral root. The sleeve of dura that surrounds the converging nerve roots merges with the outer layer of the spinal nerve. This thickening at the very beginning of the spinal nerve is the dorsal root ganglion. The spinal nerve passes forward and laterally to emerge from the intervertebral foramen. To see that more clearly, we'll go back to the preceding stage of the dissection. As the spinal nerve emerges, it divides into this small posterior primary ramus and this much larger anterior primary ramus. The posterior primary rami of the spinal nerves pass backward to supply the muscles and skin on the back of the body. The anterior rami pass forward and laterally to supply all the rest of the body. This anterior ramus is an unusually large one. It's one of a set of five large rami between C5 and T1, which form the brachial plexus. The major nerves to the upper extremity emerge from the brachial plexus. The anterior rami from L1 to S3 are also large. They form the lumbar and sacral plexuses, which give rise to the nerves for the lower extremity. These plexuses are shown in volumes one and two of this atlas. There's a man-made puzzle that we need to clear up regarding the numbering of the spinal nerves. In the cervical region, each spinal nerve takes its number from the vertebra below it. But from T1 on down, each nerve takes its number from the vertebra above it. The result is that there's one nerve, the one that emerges between C7 and T1, for which there's no corresponding vertebra. It's called C8. Now we're almost ready to move on to section two of this tape. Before we do that, let's briefly review what we've seen of the muscles of the back and the contents of the vertebral canal. Here are the short rotators, the long rotators, and the multifidus. Here's the erector spinae, spinalis, longissimus thoracis, and iliocostalis lumborum. Now, the features of the vertebral canal. Here's the spinal cord, 
the dura, the arachnoid, the pia, the subarachnoid space, the epidural space. Here are the dorsal filaments, the dorsal root, the ventral filaments, and the ventral root. Here's the dorsal root ganglion. Here's the spinal nerve, the anterior primary ramus, and the posterior primary ramus. Lastly, here's the corda equina. That brings us to the end of the first section of this tape. In the next section, we'll look at the thorax. The thorax is commonly known as the chest. In this section, we'll be looking mainly at the musculoskeletal structures of the thorax and at its principal blood vessels and nerves. We will see the lungs and the heart, but only briefly. They'll be shown fully in volume five of this atlas. We'll start, as always, with the bones. Then we'll look at the pleural membrane, then at the muscles, then at the blood vessels and nerves. The bones of the thorax are the thoracic vertebrae, the 12 pairs of ribs, and the sternum. Connecting the upper 10 pairs of ribs to the sternum are the costal cartilages. The first rib is quite small. Like all the ribs, it's angled downward from back to front. We'll take a special look at the first rib in a little while. From the first rib to the third, the thorax widens in the shape of a dome to about two-thirds of its full width. From the third rib to the seventh, the thorax widens a little further in the shape of a cone. From the seventh rib to the twelfth, the thorax narrows slightly and the ribs become very much shorter. The sternum, commonly known as the breastbone, consists of three parts. The manubrium, the body, and the ziphoid process, or ziphisternum. The manubrium is attached to the body of the sternum by a cartilaginous joint, at which a little movement is possible. There's a slight angle between the manubrium and the body, the sternal angle, that's easy to palpate as is the upper border of the manubrium. The costal cartilages form a series of flexible springy links between the ribs and the sternum. The first costal cartilage articulates with the manubrium. The second one articulates with the joint between the manubrium and the body. And the third to the sixth or seventh costal cartilages articulate with the body. Here's what the costal cartilages look like in the living body. They're quite flexible. These are the costochondral junctions where the cartilages join the ribs. The lowest four costal cartilages, the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth, join onto one another in series, forming the costal arch. The angle between the two costal arches is called the infrasternal angle. The ziphoid process projects downwards in the infrasternal angle where it can easily be palpated. The 11th and 12th ribs aren't attached to the costal arch. Since they're not linked to the sternum, they're called floating ribs. The ribs, sternum, and costal cartilages form an expandable container for the lungs and heart. This large opening, formed on each side by the costal arch and the last two ribs, is called the inferior or lower thoracic aperture. It's almost completely filled in by the diaphragm, which separates the thorax from the abdomen. The much smaller opening above that's formed by the manubrium, the first ribs, and the first thoracic vertebra is called the superior or upper thoracic aperture.
Now that we've looked at the thorax as a whole, let's take a look at a typical rib, the sixth rib. The rib is thin and flat and curved in the form of a spiral. At the back, there are two thickenings, the head and the tubercle, which are separated by the neck. The curvature of the rib is interrupted by this angle, which marks the insertion of the iliocostalis, a back muscle that we've seen already. At the front, the end of the rib is hollowed out for the attachment of the costal cartilage. The outer aspect of the rib is smoothly curved. Its inner aspect is marked on the underside by this groove in which the intercostal vessels and nerve run. As we saw in the section on the spine, the rib articulates with the adjoining vertebrae at two points, the head and the tubercle. The head of the rib has two articular facets. The two facets articulate with the vertebral bodies above and below to form the costovertebral joint. This surface on the tubercle of the rib articulates with the tip of the transverse process to form the costotransverse joint. These two joints are synovial joints. They permit the movements of the rib that occur in respiration. The joints between the ribs and the vertebrae are held together by ligaments. The strongest of these are the radiate ligament here and the superior costotransverse ligament here. The movement of the ribs is important in respiration, as we'll see later in this section. Next, we'll take a further look at the first rib, a landmark structure where the thorax becomes continuous with the neck. The first rib is the most tightly curved of all the ribs. It's also the broadest of the ribs. When seen from the side, its upper border lies in a plane that's about 30 degrees from the horizontal. In addition, when seen from in front, its flat upper surface slopes downwards, also at about 30 degrees. The costal cartilage of the first rib articulates with the manubrium of the sternum, not at the top, but lower down, at its broadest part. The first costal cartilage is short and massive. It hardly permits any movement, so the two first ribs, together with the manubrium, move up and down together as one solid arch. Here's a dissection of the manubrium and the two first ribs, with all the other ribs removed. Here's the movement these structures make when we take a deep breath in and out. The upper part of the thorax is almost completely surrounded by the muscles of the shoulder region, which arise from the ribs and also from the vertebrae. These muscles are shown in volume one of this atlas. Just to appreciate how greatly the structures of the shoulder affect the shape of the upper part of the body, we'll add to our picture at this point the bones of the shoulder region, the clavicles and the scapulae. Here's the clavicle, or collarbone. Here's the scapula, or shoulder blade. These two bones articulate with the bones of the thorax at one point only, here. The medial end of the clavicle articulates with the highest point on the manubrium, forming the sternoclavicular joint. It's easy to palpate the clavicle. Here's its medial end. The first rib is difficult to palpate. That's because it lies both below and behind the clavicle, and also because there's a thick layer of muscle in front of it. The lateral end of the clavicle articulates with this projection on the scapula, the acromion, forming the acromioclavicular joint. Apart from this one very movable bony attachment, the scapula is held onto the body entirely by muscles. It's thus capable of a wide range of movement, upward and downward, and also forward and backward around the chest wall.
Before we move on, let's briefly review what we've seen of the bones of the thorax. Here are the thoracic vertebrae and the ribs. Here's the head of the rib, the tubercle, the neck, and the angle. Here's the costovertebral joint and the costotransverse joint. Here are the costal cartilages. Here's the costal arch. Here's the sternum, the manubrium, the body, and the ziphoid process. The upper thoracic aperture and the lower thoracic aperture. Here's the clavicle, the scapula, the sternoclavicular joint, and the acromioclavicular joint. Next, we need to look at the important layer of tissue which lines the thoracic wall on the inside, the pleura. To understand the pleura, we need to take a brief look at the way the main structures inside the thorax are arranged. To see what's inside the thorax, we'll look at a dissection in which ribs 2 through 7 have been divided on each side along this line and removed, along with most of the sternum, leaving the costal arches intact. Here are the divided ends of the ribs that were removed. Here's the intact eighth rib. Here's the costal arch. Here's the divided lower end of the sternum. Here's the upper part of the manubrium. And here's the intact first rib. Here are the bodies of the thoracic vertebrae. This is our first look at the diaphragm, which forms an almost complete partition between the thorax and the abdomen. We'll take a good look at the diaphragm when we look at the muscles of respiration. With everything removed, the thoracic cavity looks like one continuous space. In reality, it's divided into two separate cavities by a partition, the mediastinum, which extends from the vertebral bodies behind to the sternum in front. The heart, the great blood vessels, the esophagus, and the trachea are contained within the thickness of the mediastinum. To see the mediastinum, we'll put the sternum back in place. Here's the sternum. Here are the divided ends of the costal cartilages. This is the mediastinum. This is the hilum, or root, of the lung. This glistening layer of smooth lining tissue is the pleura, also called the pleural membrane. It forms a complete lining for this cavity, which is called the pleural cavity. Here, the pleura is reflected off the vertebral bodies and onto the mediastinum. Here, behind the sternum, the pleura continues round onto the front of the chest wall. Below, the pleura is reflected off the chest wall and onto the diaphragm, and off the diaphragm, onto the mediastinum. Above, the pleura fills in the gap that's created by the curvature of the first rib. Here's the first rib, seen from below. Here's the highest part of the pleura, known as the dome or cupula of the pleura. Here it is, seen from the outside. We'll take a better look at the dome of the pleura from the outside in a more intact dissection. Here's the first rib. Here's the manubrium. Here's the divided end of the trachea, going down into the mediastinum. Here's the dome of the pleura. When seen from the side, the dome of the pleura is level with the proximal end of the first rib. When the pressure inside the chest is raised, the pleura rises well above the first rib. So far, we've been looking at the right side. 
the left pleural cavity is similar, except that the heart, enclosed here within the pericardium, projects into it. In the living body, the pleural cavity on each side is completely filled by the lung, which will add to the picture. Here are the lungs, discolored by a moderate degree of smoke damage. The layer of smooth tissue which covers the outside of the lung is also pleura. All the way around the pleural cavity, the two layers of pleura touch, with nothing between them except a thin film of fluid. The layer that covers the lung is called the visceral pleura. The layer that lines the cavity is called the parietal pleura. The two layers of pleura, the parietal and the visceral, are continuous with each other here, around the hilum of the lung. Each lung occupies a completely sealed space. Its volume can never be greater or less than the volume of the pleural cavity. When the volume of the cavity is increased, whether by downward movement of the diaphragm or by forward and upward movement of the ribs, the parietal pleura exerts a pull on the visceral pleura. The lung expands and we breathe in. When the volume of the cavity is decreased, the lung is compressed and we breathe out. Now we'll move on to look at the muscles that are involved in breathing in and breathing out. The act of breathing in is called inspiration. The act of breathing out is expiration. The whole process of breathing is called respiration. In looking at the muscles of respiration, we'll look first at the diaphragm, then at the muscles that produce movements of the ribs. The best way to understand the diaphragm is to look at it from below. Here are the lower ribs. The muscles between them are the intercostals, which we'll see shortly. Here's the left costal arch. Here's the xiphoid process. The anterior abdominal wall and all the abdominal organs have been removed. Now we'll take a look from below. Here's the diaphragm. It's a thin, continuous sheet of muscle with fibers that converge from all around the circumference to insert on this flat tendon, the central tendon of the diaphragm. The diaphragm arises from a line that goes right around the inside of the lower thoracic aperture, with one interruption here. To see the line of attachment, we'll remove one half of the thorax and look from inside. The line of attachment of the diaphragm goes from here on the back of the sternum, along the inside of the costal arch, and round to the tip of the twelfth rib. Between the twelfth rib and the body of the second lumbar vertebra, the diaphragm arises on each side from the fascia which overlies the two big muscles of the posterior abdominal wall. These are the quadratus lumborum and psoas major muscles. Three important structures pass through the diaphragm, the esophagus, and the two main blood vessels of the lower half of the body, the inferior vena cava and the descending aorta. This is the opening for the inferior vena cava, the vena caval foramen. This is the opening for the esophagus, the esophageal hiatus. This is the opening for the aorta. On each side of these two openings, there's a thickening of the diaphragm called a crus, the plural of which is crura. The left crus arises all the way down here on the body of L2. The right crus arises even further down on L3. The two crura arch over the aortic opening, forming the median arcuate ligament. Fibers of the two crura cross over to surround the esophageal hiatus. When the diaphragm contracts, the whole sheet of muscle, together with the central tendon, moves downward, expanding the lungs and causing us to breathe in.
As the diaphragm contracts, the structures below it, the contents of the upper part of the abdominal cavity, are pushed downwards, which leads to this bulging of the abdominal wall when we take a quiet breath in. When we're at rest and breathing quietly, inspiration is produced almost entirely by the downward pull of the diaphragm, with little or no movement of the ribs. In quiet expiration, the upward return movement of the diaphragm is produced passively by elastic forces, notably by elastic contraction of the lungs themselves. When we're breathing vigorously, the diaphragm is pushed upward actively by contraction of the muscles of the abdominal wall. These raise the pressure in the abdomen, forcing the upper abdominal organs and the diaphragm upward. Now that we've looked at the diaphragm, we'll move on to look at the muscles that produce movements of the ribs. First, we'll look at the principal muscles that produce inspiration, the external intercostals and the scalene muscles. Here are the external intercostal muscles. They're thin sheets of muscle that connect each rib to its neighbor. Each external intercostal runs from here on the rib above to here on the rib below. They extend from the tubercles of the ribs behind round to the middle of the costal cartilages in front. The fibers of the external intercostals run forward from above downward. To understand how the external intercostals act, we'll look at a simplified model of two ribs. When we apply a pulling force in the direction of the external intercostal fibers, the ribs move upwards. As the ribs move upwards, their ends, together with the sternum, move forwards. So the action of the external intercostals produces an upward and forward movement of the anterior chest wall. Next we'll look at the scalene muscles, which assist in inspiration by raising the first and second ribs. Here's the manubrium, here's the first rib, here's the second rib. Here are the scalene muscles, anterior, middle, and posterior. The anterior scalene muscle arises from the anterior tubercles of the transverse processes from C3 to C6. It inserts here on the first rib. The middle scalene muscle arises from the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes from C2 to C6 and inserts here on the first rib. The posterior scalene muscle arises from the posterior tubercles from C4 to C6 and inserts down here on the second rib. The action of the scalene muscles raises the first and second ribs and the manubrium in deep inspiration. Now we'll look at the principal muscles that produce expiration, the internal intercostals and the muscles of the abdominal wall. The internal intercostals lie just beneath the external ones, which we'll remove. Here are the internal intercostal muscles. Each internal intercostal runs from here on the rib below to here on the rib above. The internal intercostals extend from the angles of the ribs behind to the end of the intercostal spaces in front. The fibers of the internal intercostals run forward from below upward. To show how they act, we'll look at the model again with the force now applied in the direction of the internal intercostal fibers. As the force is applied, the ribs move downwards. As the ribs move downwards, their ends, together with the sternum, move backwards. The action of the internal intercostals moves the anterior chest wall downwards and backwards. The other important muscles of expiration are the muscles of the abdominal wall. They have two important effects. We've noted already that they raise the intra-abdominal pressure and so push the diaphragm up. In addition to this, abdominal wall muscles pull the lower ribs downward, assisting the action of the internal intercostals.
We'll be seeing these muscles in detail in the next section. Here, we'll just take a quick preview of them. On each side of the midline are the rectus abdominis muscles, which go from the fifth, sixth, and seventh ribs down to the pubis. Between the rectus muscles in front and the posterior abdominal wall behind, there are three sheets of muscle, one inside the other. This one, the innermost, is the transversus abdominis. Its fibers run horizontally. The uppermost ones go from the lowest four ribs to insert on this sheet of tendon, which goes to the midline. Outside transversus is the internal oblique. Its fibers arise from the iliac crest and fan out in many directions, the highest ones inserting on the lowest three ribs. Outside the internal oblique is the external oblique. It arises from the lower seven ribs and inserts partly on the iliac crest, partly into this broad tendinous sheet, the external oblique upon neurosis. The most important contribution that the abdominal wall muscles make in the movements of respiration is in the powerful action of forced expiration, as in coughing, or sneezing. In addition to the muscles of respiration that we've seen, there are some minor ones that we're going to leave out since they're unimportant. These are the levators of the ribs and the serratus posterior muscles on the outside and the transversus thoracis and innermost intercostal muscles on the inside. In addition to being an expandable container for the heart and lungs, the thorax also forms the foundation from which the upper extremity arises. The muscles of the shoulder region, which cover up most of the ribs in front and all the ribs behind, are shown in volume one of this atlas. Now, we're nearly ready to move on to look at the blood vessels and nerves of the thorax. Before we do that, let's review what we've seen of the muscles of respiration. Here's the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. Here's the pleural cavity and the mediastinum. Here's the dome of the pleura. Here's the diaphragm. The right and left crus, the vena cable foramen, the esophageal hiatus, the aortic opening. Here are the external intercostal muscles, the scalene muscles anterior, middle, and posterior, the internal intercostals. Lastly, here are the rectus abdominis, transversus abdominis, internal oblique, and external oblique muscles. Now that we've seen the bones and muscles of the thorax, we'll look at the principal blood vessels and nerves of the thoracic region. Of the blood vessels that we'll look at, there are some that we'll see only in passing, the pulmonary vessels. These are the major vessels which pass between the heart and the lungs. We'll see these more fully in Volume 5. We'll start with the arteries and we'll begin by looking at the largest artery in the body, the aorta. Here's the left pleural cavity, with the lung removed and the heart and mediastinum undisturbed. Here's the aorta, partly hidden beneath the pleura. It emerges from the left ventricle of the heart, arches over, and runs down alongside the vertebral bodies. It leaves the thorax by passing through the diaphragm and into the abdomen. To get a better look at the aorta, we'll remove the overlying pleura and part of the pericardium that surrounds the heart. We'll also remove the body of the sternum and the lower half of the manubrium. The part of the aorta that lies within the thorax is called the thoracic aorta. It's spoken of as having three parts, the ascending aorta, 
the arch, and the descending aorta. The aorta arises here from the left ventricle. To its left is the pulmonary trunk. To its right is the superior vena cava. The ascending aorta runs upwards with a slight curve to the left. It has no branches. The arch of the aorta makes a complete 180 degree turn. Beneath the arch of the aorta is the pulmonary trunk, dividing into the two pulmonary arteries. Here's the left one. This is the ligamentum arteriosum. Also beneath the arch are the left main bronchus and the left pulmonary veins. To the right of the arch is the lower end of the trachea. Before we move on to the descending aorta, we'll take a look at the three major arteries which arise from the arch. These are the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. The brachiocephalic trunk, also known as the innominate artery, divides to form the right subclavian and the right common carotid arteries. Here are the origins of these three arteries. Brachiocephalic, left common carotid, left subclavian. Here they are, emerging through the upper thoracic aperture. To see them clearly, we'll remove these veins, the right and left brachiocephalic veins, which unite to form the superior vena cava. We'll also remove the rest of the manubrium and the two first ribs, from here to here. The brachiocephalic artery divides here into the right subclavian and the right common carotid arteries. Here's the left common carotid. Here's the left subclavian. The subclavian and common carotid arteries are shown in volumes one and four, respectively. In this section, we'll look at one branch of the subclavian that's important in the thorax, the internal thoracic artery. To look at it, we'll put the first rib and the manubrium back in place. The subclavian artery arches over the upper surface of the first rib, passing behind the anterior scalene muscle. Before passing behind the anterior scalene, it gives off these branches, the thyrocervical, the vertebral, and this one, the internal thoracic. The internal thoracic artery runs downward and forward over the dome of the pleura and passes behind the first costal cartilage. To see where it goes, we'll look at a dissection of the anterior chest wall by itself, seen from behind. Here are the two internal thoracic arteries. After passing behind the first rib, which is here, each one runs down the inside of the chest wall, just lateral to the sternum, in front of the transversus thoracis muscle. Its branches supply the anterior chest wall. Its distal continuation, known as the superior epigastric artery, supplies the upper part of the anterior abdominal wall, as we'll see in the next section. Now we'll return to the aorta. We've seen the arch, now we'll look at the descending aorta. To get a clear look at it, we'll take the heart and the arch of the aorta out of the picture. The descending aorta runs downwards in close company with the esophagus. The esophagus lies medial to it up here, in front of it down here. We'll remove the esophagus. On each side, the descending aorta gives up this series of posterior intercostal arteries, one for each of the intercostal spaces except the first two. Each posterior intercostal artery passes along the deep aspect of an internal intercostal muscle in company with an intercostal vein and nerve. It stays close to the lower border of the rib in this groove that we saw earlier. Now we'll move on to look at the principal veins of the thorax.
we'll look at the two largest veins in the body, the superior and inferior vena cava, which enter the thorax from above and below and empty into the right atrium of the heart through two separate openings. We'll also see the veins of the wall of the thorax, the azygos veins. We'll start by looking at the major veins which contribute to the superior vena cava, the subclavian and internal jugular veins. On each side, the subclavian vein, the principal vein of the upper extremity, joins with the internal jugular, the principal vein of the head and neck, here, behind the medial end of the clavicle, forming the brachiocephalic vein. The two brachiocephalic veins enter the thorax and unite, forming the superior vena cava. To see the subclavian and internal jugular veins, will remove the major muscles which lie in front of them, the pectoralis major and sternocleidomastoid muscles. Here's the subclavian vein coming up from beneath pectoralis minor and passing beneath the clavicle. Here's the internal jugular vein with the omohyoid muscle in front of it. To see where these two veins join, will remove the clavicles. The subclavian vein passes over the flat anterior part of the first rib. The anterior scalene muscle separates the subclavian vein from the subclavian artery. The dome of the pleura is just behind and beneath the subclavian vein. The internal jugular vein lies in front of the common carotid artery and lateral to it. On each side, the subclavian and internal jugular veins unite to form the right and left brachiocephalic veins. The two brachiocephalic veins pass downwards into the thorax behind the manubrium. To follow them, we'll remove the anterior chest wall, as we did before. The lungs and the pericardium have also been removed. The cut ends of the two first ribs are here and here. Here are the two brachiocephalic veins, the right and the left, joining to form the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava lies well to the right of the midline. Because of this, the right brachiocephalic vein is short and runs straight downwards. The left one is longer and runs quite obliquely. The superior vena cava passes straight downwards, entering the pericardial sac here. To its left is the ascending aorta. Behind it is the trachea. The superior vena cava ends here by entering the highest part of the right atrium of the heart. The azygos vein, which we'll see in a minute, joins the vena cava from behind, just before the vena cava enters the pericardium. Next, we'll look briefly at the inferior vena cava, which brings all the blood from the lower half of the body to the right atrium. The reason we'll just look at it briefly is that within the thorax, the inferior vena cava has no length at all. It enters the right atrium as soon as it passes through the diaphragm. To see the inferior vena cava, we'll move the diaphragm downward and move the heart to the left. Here's the inferior vena cava. After coming up through the diaphragm, it passes almost immediately into the lower part of the right atrium. It enters separately from the superior vena cava, which is here. We'll look at the course of the inferior vena cava below the diaphragm in the next section of this tape. Now, we'll look at the azygos vein and its tributaries. Here's the azygos vein, arching over the right main bronchus and joining the superior vena cava. To see where it comes from, we'll remove the heart and all the other structures of the mediastinum. Here's where the azygos vein has been divided. The azygos vein begins below the diaphragm and runs up along the right side of the vertebral column. The azygos vein receives blood from the posterior and lateral parts of the chest wall. On the right side, the posterior intercostal veins 
empty directly into it. On the left side, the posterior intercostal empty into these two hemiazygos veins, which in turn empty into the azygos. Now that we've looked at the arteries and veins of the thorax, we'll move on to look at the nerves. The nerves that we'll see are the phrenic nerve, the vagus nerve, the sympathetic trunk, and the intercostal nerves. We'll look at the phrenic and vagus nerves first. The phrenic is the motor and sensory nerve of the diaphragm. The vagus provides the parasympathetic supply for all the organs of the thorax and abdomen. The courses of these two nerves are similar. They both start in the neck, run downward in the mediastinum, and pass through the diaphragm. We'll look at them first in the neck. In this dissection, the clavicles and the sternocleidomastoid muscles have been removed. Here's the phrenic nerve. It runs down on the front of the anterior scalene muscle and passes in front of the subclavian artery and behind the subclavian vein. To see the vagus nerve, we'll retract the internal jugular vein. Here's the vagus nerve. It lies behind and between the internal jugular vein and the common carotid artery. It passes in front of the subclavian artery. On the right side only, the vagus gives off this branch, the recurrent laryngeal, which curls around the artery and passes upwards to the larynx. To follow these two nerves, we'll remove the anterior chest wall. Here's the phrenic nerve. Here's the vagus nerve. The phrenic nerve passes behind the subclavian vein, which has been divided here, and runs downward in the mediastinum, in front of the root of the lung, close to the superior vena cava and right atrium. The phrenic nerve passes through the diaphragm. In the intact mediastinum, the phrenic nerve runs here, just beneath the pleura. On the left side, the course of the phrenic nerve is similar. In its course in the mediastinum, it passes over the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, and the left ventricle. To see the course of the vagus nerves, we'll remove the brachiocephalic veins and the superior vena cava. On the right side, the vagus nerve passes downward and backward, close to the trachea, to reach the esophagus. It breaks up into several branches as it runs down along the esophagus. On the left side, the vagus nerve crosses the arch of the aorta and passes backward to run down alongside the esophagus and through the diaphragm. On the left side, the recurrent laryngeal branch is given off here and curls around the arch of the aorta to return to the neck. Now we'll look at the intercostal nerves and at the sympathetic trunk. Here are the vertebral bodies. Here's the proximal end of one of the ribs. Here are three of the intercostal nerves. They're the direct continuation of the anterior rami of the thoracic spinal nerves. They give motor innervation to the intercostal muscles and sensory innervation to the chest wall. They run closely with the intercostal blood vessels, which have been removed in this dissection. This slender, irregular cord is the sympathetic trunk. We won't go into a description here of the many functions of the sympathetic system or of its somewhat complex arrangement. The details that follow are shown on the premise that you've either just learned about these things or that you're just about to do so. The sympathetic trunk runs alongside the vertebral column all the way from T1 down to the sacrum. This thickening is one of the ganglia of the sympathetic trunk. These fine connections between the sympathetic trunk and the anterior rami of the spinal nerves are the rami communicantes. The nerves passing medially from the sympathetic trunk are the splanchnic nerves on their way to the celiac and mesenteric ganglia. Now, let's review what we've seen of the blood vessels and nerves of the thorax.
Here's the ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta, and the descending aorta. Here's the brachiocephalic artery, the right subclavian, the right common carotid, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian arteries. Here's the internal thoracic artery. Here are the subclavian veins, the internal jugular veins, the brachiocephalic veins, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the azygos vein, and the hemiazygos veins. Here's the phrenic nerve and the vagus nerve. And in the chest, the vagus nerve and the phrenic nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right and on the left. Here are three of the intercostal nerves. Here's the sympathetic trunk, a ramus communicans, and a splanchnic nerve. There's one more important structure to include while we're looking at the thorax, the breast. The female breast varies greatly in size and also in shape. From above down, the breast extends from about the level of the second rib to the sixth rib. From side to side, it extends from the edge of the sternum to about the mid-axillary line. This prolongation of the breast behind is called the axillary tail. This pigmented area is the areola. It surrounds the nipple, which is the point at which the lactiferous ducts emerge. To see the internal structure of the breast, we'll remove one half of it along this line. The breast consists largely of fat. This is the breast of a postmenopausal individual in whom the glandular breast tissue has shrunk to a rather small proportion of the whole breast. The breast lies directly in front of the fascia that covers the pectoralis major muscle. Beneath the areola, the lactiferous ducts here's one of them, converge on their separate openings on the nipple. That brings us to the end of this section on the thorax. In the next section, we'll look in a similar way at the abdomen. In this section, we'll look at the musculoskeletal structures that surround the abdomen. We'll look first at the bones that lie above, behind, and below the abdominal cavity. Then we'll see the layers of muscle and tendon that form the wall of the abdomen. After that, we'll take a detailed look at the lowest part of the abdominal wall, the inguinal region. Lastly, we'll look at the principal blood vessels and nerves of the region. We'll look at the abdomen in this tape as a container, as we did with the thorax. We'll look at what it contains in volume 5 of this atlas. Let's start with the bones that we're concerned with. The lower ribs, the lumbar vertebrae, and the bones of the pelvis. We're familiar with the rib cage already. The lower edge of the rib cage, formed by the last three ribs and the costal arch, is called the costal margin. Just above the costal margin on the inside, the diaphragm arises, as we've already seen. The diaphragm forms the upper limit of the abdominal cavity. Because of the shape of the diaphragm, the upper part of the abdominal cavity extends a long way above the costal margin. The rib cage is also a major site of attachment for abdominal wall muscles, as we began to see in the last section. The lumbar vertebrae provide the foundation for the posterior part of the abdominal wall.
the massive bodies of the vertebrae project forward into the abdominal cavity. Next, we'll take a further look at the bones of the pelvis. For a start, we need to understand something about the word pelvis. The pelvis is commonly used as the short name for two different things, the bony pelvis and the pelvic cavity. This is the bony pelvis, consisting of the sacrum and the two hip bones. This is the pelvic cavity. It's the deep and narrow space that's enclosed by the sacrum, the lower parts of the hip bones, and by ligaments and muscles that we'll see in the next section. The pelvic cavity is continuous with the abdominal cavity here, at the pelvic brim, which we'll return to in a minute. To understand the abdomen, we need to understand the upper and anterior parts of the bony pelvis. We took a good look at the sacrum in the first section of this tape. The only parts of it that we'll mention here are the most anterior part, the promontory, and this broad part, the ala, or wing of the sacrum. Now we need to take a look at some important features of the hip bone. The hip bone is also known as the innominate bone. It develops by the fusion of three originally separate bones, the massive ischium below and behind, the more lightly constructed pubis below and in front, and the broad ilium above. We'll look at the ilium first. The thick lower part of the ilium is the body. The broad expanse of bone that fans out above the body is the ala, or wing of the ilium. The concavity on the inner surface of the ala is known as the iliac fossa. This roughened area, the auricular surface, articulates with the sacrum, forming the sacroiliac joint. The broad roughened edge of the ala of the ilium is the iliac crest. The iliac crest ends behind at the posterior superior iliac spine. It ends in front at this important projection, the anterior superior iliac spine. The iliac crest lies close to the surface all the way along its length. The anterior superior iliac spine is here. Next, we'll look at the pubis. This is the superior pubic ramus. This is the body of the pubis. And this is the ischio pubic ramus. This thick ridge is the pubic crest, which ends at this prominence, the pubic tubercle. Lateral to the tubercle, the superior ramus of the pubis has a sharp upper border called the pecten. The two hip bones are held together in front by a cartilaginous joint, the pubic symphysis. The front of the pubic symphysis is here. The pelvic brim, the narrowing which forms the open end of the pelvic cavity, is made up by the pubic symphysis in front, by the promontory of the sacrum behind, and on each side by the ala of the sacrum, this shoulder on the body of the ilium, called the arcuate line, and by the superior ramus of the pubis. The parts of the bony pelvis that lie below the pelvic brim, the ischium and the ischiopubic ramus, don't concern us at present. We'll look at them in the next section. As we've looked at the features of the bony pelvis, we've been seeing them in the position they're in when we're standing upright. It's useful to keep in mind certain basic planes and angles. In the normal standing position, the anterior superior iliac spines and the front of the pubic symphysis are in the same vertical plane when seen from the side. The plane of the pelvic brim is tilted at about 60 degrees to the horizontal. The pelvic surface of the sacrum slopes at 30 degrees to the horizontal.
the pubic symphysis is tilted at almost the same angle. It's also useful to keep in mind the distance between the costal margin above and the pelvis below, and the way that distance changes from the front to the side. In front, it's a long way from the xiphoid process down to the pubic symphysis. But at the side, the costal margin and the iliac crest are only this far apart. Now let's review what we've seen of the bones of the abdominal region. Here's the costal margin. Here are the lumbar vertebrae. Here's the ilium, the body of the ilium, the wing of the ilium, the iliac fossa, the iliac crest, the anterior superior iliac spine. Here's the pubis with the superior pubic ramus, the body of the pubis, the ischiopubic ramus, the pubic crest, the pubic tubercle, the pecten, and the pubic symphysis. Before we look at the muscles, there's one important structure that we need to add to the picture, the inguinal ligament. Here's the inguinal ligament. It's a strong band of tendinous tissue that goes from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. There's a gap between the inguinal ligament and the underlying bone. Through this gap, some important structures pass from the abdomen to the thigh, including the femoral vein, artery, and nerve medially, and the belly of the psoas and iliacus muscles laterally. The inguinal ligament isn't an isolated structure. As we'll see, it's the lowest part of the external oblique aponeurosis, which is the outermost of the muscular and tendinous layers of the anterior abdominal wall. Now, we'll move on to look at the muscles that make up the wall that surrounds the abdominal cavity. We'll begin with the muscles which, along with the vertebral column and the diaphragm, form the posterior part of the abdominal wall. We look at the erector spiny muscles and their surrounding fascia, then at quadratus lumborum, then at psoas major and iliacus. We're looking from behind. Here's the iliac crest. Here's the twelfth rib. Here's the midline. Here are the muscles known collectively as the erector spiny. We looked at them in the first section of this tape. They arise from the sacrum and from this part of the iliac crest. They're inserted on the thoracic vertebrae and on the backs of the ribs. The erector spiny muscles are enclosed on the front and on the back by this envelope of tendinous tissue called the thoracolumbar fascia. The layer on the back of the erector spiny arises from the spinous processes. The layer on the front arises from the transverse processes. The two layers of thoracolumbar fascia fuse into one thick layer along the border of erector spinae. The thoracolumbar fascia is an important attachment for muscles of the abdominal wall, as we'll see shortly. Next, we'll add quadratus lumborum to the picture. Here's quadratus lumborum. It lies in front of the erector spinae muscles and their investing fascia. Quadratus lumborum arises from the twelfth rib and the transverse processes of the upper three lumbar vertebrae. It's inserted on the most medial part of the iliac crest and the transverse process of L5. Quadratus lumborum assists in producing lateral flexion of the lumbar spine. Lying medial to quadratus lumborum is psoas major. Psoas major arises from the transverse processes, vertebral bodies, and intervertebral discs from T12 to L5. It runs down across the ailer of the sacrum, across the sacroiliac joint, and along the pelvic brim.
Before seeing where Psoas Major goes, we'll add its close neighbor, Eliacus, to the picture. Here's the Eliacus muscle. It fills the iliac fossa. Eliacus arises from this wide area on the wing of the ilium. Down here, the medial fibers of Eliacus and the lateral fibers of psoas major join, forming a single muscle belly known as the iliopsoas. The iliopsoas runs beneath the inguinal ligament and passes backwards to insert here on the lesser trochanter of the femur. As they slope downward and forward toward the inguinal ligament, the iliacus and psoas muscles are covered by this layer of dense connective tissue, the iliacus fascia, which will meet when we look at the inguinal ligament. This is just the lower part of it. The iliacus fascia is covered in turn by the membrane which lines the abdominal cavity, the peritoneum. This is a preview of the peritoneum. We'll see it more fully later in this section. When we're looking at the abdomen, we tend to see psoas and iliacus as static background structures, but they have an important function. They're the principal muscles that produce flexion at the hip joint. Now that we've looked at the individual muscles, let's take an overall look at the structures that form the posterior abdominal wall. To do that, we'll add the diaphragm to the picture. The steeply rising diaphragm forms the highest part of the abdominal wall, not only at the back, but all around. The diaphragm makes a dome-shaped partition separating the abdominal cavity below from the thoracic cavity above. At the bottom, the middle part of the posterior abdominal wall, formed by the vertebral bodies, becomes continuous with the wall of the pelvic cavity here at the sacral promontory. On each side, the psoas muscle stands away from the vertebral bodies like a pillar. The iliacus muscles, with their investing fascia, form a continuation of the posterior abdominal wall that slopes downward, forward, and inward, ending here at the inguinal ligament. This is the lowest part of the anterior abdominal wall. In this dissection, all the abdominal blood vessels and nerves have been removed, together with most of the peritoneum. We'll add those structures to the picture later in this section. Now, with our focus still on muscles, we'll move on to look at the four muscles which form the great expanse of the lateral and anterior abdominal wall. These muscles fill in the huge gap that's created by the costal margin above the edge of the thoracolumbar fascia behind, and the iliac crest, the inguinal ligament, and the pubic crest below. First, we'll look at the rectus abdominis, which runs vertically next to the midline from the lower anterior ribs to the pubis. Then, we'll look at the three large flat muscles, transversus abdominis, internal oblique, and external oblique. There's a time-honored word that's used in describing the tendons of the flat muscles, aponeurosis. Aponeurosis is a word that's used to describe a tendon that's in the form of a sheet. We'll look at the rectus abdominis muscle first. Here's the rectus abdominis, together with the innermost of the flat muscles, transversus. The rectus abdominis is a very long muscle, wide at the top, and tapering to a more narrow attachment at the bottom. It arises from the fifth, sixth, and seventh costal cartilages. It's inserted on the pubic crest. The rectus is divided on the front by these bands of tendon called tendinous intersections. Sometimes there are three of them, sometimes four, as in this case. The intersections go about halfway through the muscle. The action of the rectus muscles is to produce flexion of the lumbar spine. The rectus muscles act in opposition to the erector spinae muscles. Besides producing active flexion, the rectus muscles have an important static effect. They keep the lumbar spine straight 
at times when the force of gravity tends to extend it. In the intact body, the rectus abdominis is enclosed on the front and on the back by a tendinous envelope that's formed by the aponeuroses of the three flat muscles. This is the posterior layer of the rectus sheath. The posterior layer ends here, about three quarters of the way down the muscle. Sometimes it ends gradually, sometimes abruptly, with a distinct lower border known as the arcuate line. Below here, there's just a little loose fascia between the back of the rectus and the peritoneum. Now we'll add the anterior layer of the rectus sheath to the picture. The anterior layer extends all the way from the costal margin to the pubis. If we incise the anterior rectus sheath and try to retract it, we can see that it's firmly attached to the tenderness intersections. There's one here, another one here. Here, we've divided those adhesions so that we can retract the anterior rectus sheath medially. The two layers of the rectus sheath come together near the midline. Here's the posterior layer. Both layers insert into this dense midline band of tenderness tissue, the linear alba. The linear alba extends from the xiphoid process to the pubis. We'll see more of the rectus sheath as we look at the aponeuroses of the three flat muscles. We'll look at the flat muscles next. Flat may not be the best word to describe them. In the vertical plane, they're markedly curved, as we'll see. We'll look at all three of them, then we'll look at their actions. We'll start with the innermost of the three flat muscles, transversus abdominis. Here's transversus abdominis. The fibers of transversus all run in the same transverse direction, except the lowest ones, which run obliquely downwards. Transversus abdominis has a long line of origin, from here to here. At the top, its fibers arise from the inner aspect of the costal margin, from the sixth rib to the twelfth. Between the twelfth rib and the ilium, transversus arises from the edge of the thoracolumbar fascia. Below, it arises from the inner aspect of the iliac crest. The lowest fibers of transversus arise from the most lateral part of the inguinal ligament. Transversus has a short, free lower border. The muscle fibers of transversus end in this broad sheet of tendon, the transversus aponeurosis. The transversus aponeurosis fuses here with the aponeurosis of the overlying internal oblique muscle to form one aponeurotic layer. Now we'll add the internal oblique muscle to the picture. The internal oblique arises from the thoracolumbar fascia and from the iliac crest. The lowest fibers of the internal oblique arise, like those of transversus, from the lateral part of the inguinal ligament. Like transversus, the internal oblique has a short, free lower border. The internal oblique fans out so that its highest and lowest fibers run in markedly different directions. Back here, the fibers of the internal oblique run steeply upward. Here, they run less steeply. Here, they're transverse. And here, towards the inguinal ligament, they run downward. The highest fibers of the internal oblique insert on the lowest three ribs. Its remaining fibers end in this internal oblique aponeurosis, which, as we noted, fuses on the underside with the transversus aponeurosis. It's also joined on its outer aspect by the external oblique aponeurosis. This is the cut edge of external oblique. From here to here, the combined aponeurotic layer divides at the edge of the rectus into two layers, one passing behind and one in front of the rectus. Below here, the combined layer doesn't divide, but passes entirely in front of the muscle. Now that we've looked at the internal oblique, it's time to add the external oblique muscle to the picture. Here's the external oblique muscle, 
the outermost of the three flat muscles. The fibres of the external oblique spiral downwards and forwards at the side, downwards and medially in front. The external oblique arises from a broad area on the outside of the rib cage, all the way from here on the twelfth rib to here on the fifth rib. The zigzag line of origin of the external oblique fits in with the line of origin of serratus anterior. Though it's all one continuous muscle, we'll look at the external oblique in two parts, a posterior part that arises from the twelfth to the tenth ribs, and an anterior part that arises from the ninth to the sixth rib. The anterior part of the external oblique ends in this external oblique aponeurosis. This fuses with the combined aponeuroses of the other two flat muscles to form the anterior rectus sheath. The external oblique aponeurosis has a long free lower border between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. As we've seen already, this free lower border is the inguinal ligament, which we'll see in detail shortly. The part of the external oblique that arises from the 10th to the 12th ribs remains fleshy from its origin to its insertion. It inserts along the outer edge of the anterior half of the iliac crest. Here, at the back, the external oblique has a short free border between the 12th rib and the iliac crest. Now that we've looked at all three of the flat muscles, we'll look at their actions. When the three flat muscles on both sides contract together, as they usually do, they raise the pressure inside the abdominal cavity. When our airway is open, the rise in intra-abdominal pressure pushes the diaphragm upwards, causing air to leave the lungs, as we saw in the last section. When we hold our breath by closing our larynx, the flat muscles provide the pressure that's needed to expel the contents of either the rectum, the bladder, or the uterus through their respective openings. When the oblique muscles contract individually, they also play a part in producing lateral flexion of the lumbar spine and rotation of the thoracic spine. Now that we've looked at all the muscles that form the walls of the abdominal cavity, we'll take a look inside the cavity itself. To do that, we'll look at a dissection in which the abdominal organs and the left half of the anterior abdominal wall have been removed. Here's the serous membrane that lines the abdominal cavity, the parietal peritoneum. We'll see it in more detail in Volume 5. Beneath the peritoneum, there's a continuous layer of loose connective tissue. Here, as we've seen, it's called the iliacus fascia. Here, on the inside of the anterior abdominal wall, it's called the transversalis fascia. Now, we'll move on to look at the inguinal region. An important feature that we'll see is a structure that passes obliquely through the abdominal wall, just above the inguinal ligament. In the female, the structure is the round ligament of the uterus. In the male, it's the spermatic cord, the lifeline of the testis. The passage that the structure passes through is called the inguinal canal. We'll start by taking a more detailed look at the inguinal ligament. In this dissection, the body has been divided in the midline. Here's the anterior superior iliac spine. Here's the pubic symphysis. Here's the inguinal ligament. It's the lowest part of the external oblique aponeurosis. Laterally, the ligament is attached to the anterior superior iliac spine. Medially, it's attached to the pubic tubercle. The cut edge here was created by dividing the external oblique aponeurosis along this line. The edge of the inguinal ligament can't be seen from the outside because the fascia lata, the investing deep fascia of the thigh, is attached to the ligament along here. To see the edge of the ligament, we'll go round to the inside. Here's the edge of the ligament. The iliacus fascia, which has been removed in this dissection, 
comes down over the iliopsoas and is attached to the ligament along here. The lowest fibers of the inguinal ligament curl around to form this triangular extension, the lacunar ligament. The lacunar ligament runs backwards and a little upwards to insert on the sharp upper edge of the superior pubic ramus, the pectin. The lateral part of the inguinal ligament gives rise to the lowest fibers of the transversus and internal oblique muscles. Here's transversus. Its lowest fibers arise from about the lateral one quarter of the inguinal ligament. Now we'll add the internal oblique to the picture. Here it is. The lowest fibers of the internal oblique arise from the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament. The tendinous fibers of these two muscles arch over and unite to form this flat tendon, the conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon is attached to the pubic crest and also behind to the pectin. Now we'll bring this lowest part of the external oblique aponeurosis up to its natural position and add the rest of the aponeurosis to the picture. Here it is. There's an opening in the external oblique aponeurosis, the superficial inguinal ring. Through this, the spermatic cord, or the round ligament, passes as we'll see shortly. The fibers below and above the opening are called the inferior crus and the superior crus of the superficial inguinal ring. They're attached to the pubic tubercle and the pubic crest, respectively. The inguinal canal passes through the superficial inguinal ring, then beneath the free borders of the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle. To see where the inguinal canal begins, we'll go around to the inside. It begins at this arch beneath the lower border of transversus, which is called the deep inguinal ring. Now we'll look at the spermatic cord. In the developing embryo, the migrating testis pushes its way through the abdominal wall and into the scrotum creating the inguinal canal as it does so. The testis drags behind itself its own blood vessels and the vas deferens, and it carries along as a covering a little of each layer that it goes through. To see the result, we'll look at a dissection in which the spermatic cord has been kept intact. Here's the spermatic cord with its outer layers removed. To see the structures that run inside the cord, we'll go round to a rear view again. The deep inguinal ring is here, hidden by the transversalis fascia. The iliacus fascia has been removed. The structures that pass through the deep inguinal ring and into the spermatic cord are the blood vessels to the testis, the testicular artery and vein, and the vas deferens, which passes over the pelvic brim and into the pelvis. Emerging from beneath transversus, the vas deferens and the blood vessels are surrounded by this coating of internal spermatic fascia. Now we'll add the internal oblique muscle. The internal spermatic fascia is surrounded by this layer of muscle, the cremaster muscle. Here's the cut edge of the external oblique aponeurosis. We'll add the rest of the external oblique aponeurosis to the picture. As the cord emerges from the superficial inguinal ring, it lies in front of the pubic tubercle, here. This edge of the superficial ring is a dissection artifact. In reality, it's continuous with the outermost layer of the spermatic cord, the external spermatic fascia. From here, the spermatic cord goes down into the scrotum. We'll look at the testis in volume five of this atlas. Now, we're about ready to move on to look at the principal blood vessels and nerves of the abdomen. Before we do that, let's review what we've seen of the muscles and the structures of the inguinal region. Here's the thoracolumbar fascia quadratus lumborum, 
Soas Major, and Eliacus. Here's rectus abdominis, the tendinous intersections, the posterior rectus sheath, the arcuate line, the anterior rectus sheath. Here's transversus abdominis, the internal oblique, and external oblique muscles. Here's the inguinal ligament, the lacunar ligament, the deep inguinal ring, the superficial inguinal ring, and the spermatic cord. Now we'll move on to look at the blood vessels of the abdominal region. First the arteries, then the veins. We'll start by looking at the part of the descending aorta that lies below the diaphragm, the abdominal aorta. Here's the posterior abdominal wall with the arteries in place and the veins removed. Here's the abdominal aorta. It enters the abdomen by passing through the aortic opening in the diaphragm at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra. The aorta runs down on the front of the lumbar vertebral bodies just to the left of the midline. It ends by dividing at the level of L4 into the right and left common iliac arteries. The point where it divides is called the aortic bifurcation. In looking at the branches of the abdominal aorta, we'll begin with the three which arise in the midline and supply the gastrointestinal organs. Then, we'll look at the branches that arise in pairs. The three midline branches are the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. The celiac trunk arises immediately below the margin of the aortic opening at the level of T12. It divides into three branches, the common hepatic, the left gastric, and the splenic. Between them, these supply the liver, stomach, duodenum, pancreas, and spleen. The superior mesenteric artery arises at the level of L1. Its branches supply the small intestine and much of the large intestine. The inferior mesenteric artery arises at the level of L3. Its branches supply the distal part of the large intestine. Of the branches of the aorta that arise in pairs, much the largest are the right and left renal arteries, which supply the kidneys. They arise just below the level of the superior mesenteric artery. Arising at about L2 are, in the female, the ovarian, and in the male, the testicular arteries, which run downward and laterally over the psoas muscle. Four pairs of lumbar arteries arise from the back of the aorta. Here are the lower two. They pass behind psoas major, where they branch to supply the back, the spine, and the abdominal wall. Lastly, here's the median sacral artery, which arises from the back of the aorta, just above the bifurcation, and passes down into the pelvis. Next, we'll look at the common iliac arteries and at their branches. On each side, the common iliac divides into the internal and external iliac arteries. The common iliac artery runs close to the medial border of psoas major. It divides here at the pelvic brim. Here's the external iliac artery. Here's the internal. We'll look at the internal iliac in the next section. The external iliac artery is the main artery to the lower extremity. It runs along the pelvic brim, just medial to psoas major, and passes beneath the inguinal ligament. Below the inguinal ligament, the artery goes by a different name, the femoral artery. Just before passing beneath the ligament, the external iliac gives off two branches, the deep circumflex iliac laterally and the inferior epigastric medially. The inferior epigastric supplies the lower part of the abdominal wall. We'll see where it goes in a minute. But first, 
We'll add the principal veins of the abdominal region to the picture. We'll start down at the inguinal ligament. Here's the femoral vein, lying medial to the femoral artery as it passes beneath the inguinal ligament. Above the ligament, it's called the external iliac vein. The external iliac is joined by the internal iliac to form the common iliac vein. The two common iliacs join just to the right of the aortic bifurcation to form the inferior vena cava. The right common iliac artery passes in front of the left common iliac vein. The inferior vena cava runs just to the right of the midline. It lies on the vertebral bodies from L4 to T12, then on the left cross of the diaphragm. It passes through the diaphragm here to enter the right atrium, as we saw in the last section. The two large renal veins join the inferior vena cava at the level of L2. This is the left testicular vein. The right one has been removed. There aren't any veins that directly correspond to the celiac trunk and the mesenteric arteries. The blood that goes out through those arteries comes back to the liver by way of the portal vein, as we'll see in volume 5 of this atlas. The blood from the liver then returns to the main circulation through these large hepatic veins. The hepatic veins are very short. Their number varies. Here, there are three. They enter the vena cava just below the diaphragm. Next, we'll look briefly at the main blood vessels of the anterior abdominal wall, the superior epigastric and inferior epigastric. We've seen that the inferior epigastric artery arises from the external iliac. The superior epigastric artery is the continuation of the internal thoracic. We saw it in the last section. In this dissection, the peritoneum and fascia on the inside of the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall have been removed. Here are the external iliac vessels. Here are the inferior epigastric artery and vein. They pass upward and medially and run up the back of the rectus abdominis muscle. They enter the rectus sheath by passing in front of the arcuate line. The superior epigastrics also lie behind the rectus abdominis. To see them, we've removed the upper part of the posterior rectus sheath. Here's the superior epigastric artery, emerging from behind the costal margin and passing down onto the back of the rectus. Its branches are anastomose with those of the inferior epigastric within the rectus muscle. Now we'll move on to look briefly at the principal nerves of the abdominal region. First, we'll see the nerves that provide the motor and sensory supply to the lateral and anterior abdominal wall. These nerves are continuations of the lower intercostal nerves from T7 downwards. Here are four of them. They emerge beneath the costal margin. Here's the 11th rib. Here's the start of the costal arch. The nerves run obliquely downwards and forwards in the plane between the transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscles. The external oblique has largely been removed in this dissection. Next, we'll look at the nerves of the posterior abdominal wall. Most of these are derived from the lumbar plexus, a complex joining and rebranching of the anterior primary rami from the 12th thoracic to the 5th lumbar segment. The lumbar plexus lies behind and within the psoas major muscle. The nerves that arise from the lumbar plexus emerge from beneath psoas major or through it. Here are the subcostal nerve, which comes from T12, the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, and the genitofemoral nerve. Between them, these provide sensation to the inguinal region and to the anterior part of the upper thigh. Here are two major nerves of the lower extremity, the femoral nerve emerging lateral to psoas major and the obturator nerve emerging medial to it. The femoral nerve runs alongside psoas major and passes beneath the inguinal ligament just lateral to the femoral artery. The obturator nerve runs just below the pelvic brim and enters the obturator canal.
The femoral and obturator nerves are shown in more detail in volume two of this atlas. Lastly, we'll look at the principal autonomic nerves of the abdomen, the vagus nerves, the sympathetic trunks, and the aortic plexus. Here's the aortic bifurcation. Here's the upper part of psoas major. Here's the right cross of the diaphragm. Here's the sympathetic trunk emerging through the edge of the diaphragm and running close to the vertebral bodies down toward the pelvis. Again, here's the right cross of the diaphragm. Here are the divided celiac trunk and superior mesenteric artery. This is a large sympathetic ganglion. It's connected to this smaller one and to several others that have been removed in this dissection. Together, they form the aortic plexus, which distributes sympathetic innervation to most of the abdominal viscera. To see the vagus nerves as they enter the abdominal cavity, we'll look at a dissection in which the stomach has been left intact. This is the stomach. Here's the esophagus. It comes through the diaphragm here. Here are two branches of the right vagus nerve, also passing through the esophageal hiatus. The branches of the left vagus are out of sight, round here. The vagus nerves break up into many smaller branches, which provide the parasympathetic supply to the stomach, the small and large intestines, and other abdominal organs. Now let's review what we've seen of the blood vessels and nerves of the abdominal region. Here's the abdominal aorta, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric, and inferior mesenteric arteries. Here are the renal arteries, the testicular or ovarian arteries, the lumbar arteries, the median sacral artery. Here's the common iliac, internal iliac, external iliac, and femoral artery, the deep circumflex iliac, and inferior epigastric arteries, the inferior vena cava, and the hepatic veins. Here are the subcostal nerve, the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, the genitofemoral nerve, the femoral nerve, and the obturator nerve. Here's the sympathetic trunk, a sympathetic ganglion, and the vagus nerve. That brings us to the end of this section on the abdomen. In the next section, we'll look at the pelvis. In this section, we'll look at the pelvic cavity. We'll look first at the bones and ligaments that surround the cavity. Then, we'll look at the muscles of the pelvic walls and the pelvic floor. Then, we'll see the principal blood vessels and nerves of the region. We'll start with the bones. We've already seen the upper parts of the bony pelvis. Now, we need to look at the parts of it that lie below the pelvic brim. Let's get oriented. Here's the bony pelvis, together with the fifth lumbar vertebra. Here's the pelvic brim. We'll be looking at the pelvic cavity from four different viewpoints. We look down into it from above. We'll look at it from the side, with the opposite half of the pelvis removed. We'll look at it from behind and we'll look at it from below. We looked at the features of the upper part of the bony pelvis in the last section. The bones that contribute to the walls of the pelvic cavity are the sacrum and the coccyx behind, and the lower parts of the hip bone in front and at the side. 
We're looking at the bones in the position they occupy when we're standing upright. In the upright position, the surface of the upper part of the sacrum is angled at 30 degrees to the horizontal. The tip of the coccyx points forward at about 40 degrees. So the pelvic surfaces of the sacrum and coccyx form a curve of a bit more than a quarter circle. The lower end of the sacrum is on a level with the top of the pubic symphysis. This big gap between the sacrum and the hip bone is called the sciatic notch. It's bridged by two major ligaments, as we'll see shortly. Now, we'll look at some details of the hip bone. This massively thick part of the hip bone is formed by the fusion of the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. It's smooth on the inside and on the back. It's deeply indented on the outside by the socket of the hip joint, the acetabulum. This is the body of the ischium, which ends below in this impressive projection, the ischial tuberosity, which is what we sit on. This sharp prominence is the ischial spine. The large hole in the lower part of the hip bone is the obturator foramen. In the living body, it's largely closed off by the obturator membrane. This is the body of the pubis. The part of the hip bone below the obturator foramen is the ischiopubic ramus. The two ischiopubic rami, meeting in front at the pubic symphysis, form the pubic arch. When seen from the side, the ischiopubic rami slope backward and downwards toward the ischial tuberosities. There are important differences in shape between the male pelvis and the female pelvis, which is adapted to the important requirements of childbirth. The female pelvic cavity is wider from side to side and deeper from front to back than the male. In addition, the angle of the female pubic arch is broader. When seen from below, the inferior pelvic aperture of the female is wider in all directions than that of the male. Now that we've looked at the dry bones, we'll look at some major ligaments which are important in holding the sacrum and the hip bones together. The weight of the body is transmitted from the vertebral column to the hip bone at the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is strengthened behind and in front by ligaments. The anterior sacroiliac ligament in front and the massive posterior sacroiliac ligament behind. In addition, the sacroiliac joint is strengthened by two major ligaments which pass from the sacrum to the ischium, the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments. Here's the sacrotuberous ligament. The sacrotuberous ligament arises here on the back of the sacrum. It passes laterally, downward, and slightly forward. It's inserted here on the ischial tuberosity. Now we'll add the sacrospinous ligament to the picture. Here it is. The sacrospinous ligament lies in front of the sacrotuberous ligament and medial to it. It goes from here on the edge of the sacrum to here on the ischial spine. These two ligaments divide the gap between the sacrum and the ischium into two openings, the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. Let's take a look at a complete pelvic specimen from behind and from below. The sacrotuberous ligaments behind and the ischiopubic rami in front form the boundaries of an opening beneath the pelvis that's called the inferior pelvic aperture. Seen from beneath, the opening looks like an ellipse, but it's not a flat ellipse. Because of the steep downward curve of the sacrotuberous ligaments behind, and the slight downward slope of the ischiopubic rami in front, the ellipse has a marked bend in it. 
Here's the inferior pelvic aperture seen from above. When we look at it from up here, it's not so easy to appreciate the three-dimensional shape of the opening. Now, let's review what we've seen of the bones and ligaments that surround the pelvic cavity. Here's the hip bone, the sacrum, and the coccyx. Here's the sciatic notch. Here's the pelvic brim. Here's the obturator foramen, the body of the ischium, the ischial spine, and the ischial tuberosity. Here's the body of the pubis, the ischiopubic ramus, the pubic symphysis, and the pubic arch. Here are the sacroiliac ligaments, anterior and posterior. Here's the sacrotuberous ligament and the sacrospinous ligament. Here's the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. Now, we'll look at the muscles of the pelvic cavity. First, we'll look at two muscles which form part of the wall of the pelvic cavity, piriformis and obturator internus. Then, we'll look at the complex sheet of muscles, collectively called the pelvic diaphragm, which form the floor of the pelvic cavity. We'll look at these structures first in a male specimen. Piriformis and obturator internus are both hip rotator muscles, which arise within the pelvis and pass outward through the sciatic foramina. Here's piriformis. Piriformis arises from here on the sacrum. It passes laterally and leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. We'll see where it goes in a minute. Next we'll add obturator internus to the picture. Obturator internus arises from the obturator membrane and from this wide area around it. Obturator internus leaves the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen. In doing so, it makes a 90 degree turn around the lower part of the ischium. Piriformis and obturator internus pass laterally to insert on the greater trochanter of the femur. Their actions as lateral hip rotators are shown in volume two of this atlas. In this section, we're concerned to understand these two muscles simply as parts of the wall of the pelvic cavity. The obturator internus muscle is covered on the inside by this layer of pelvic fascia. There's an important line of thickening in the fascia called the tendinous arch. The tendinous arch goes from the body of the pubis to the ischial spine. We'll see why the tendinous arch is important in a moment. Now we'll move on to look at the muscles of the pelvic diaphragm. These muscles form a sling which closes off the inferior pelvic aperture and supports the organs that lie within the pelvic cavity. On each side the pelvic diaphragm is formed by two most unequal muscles the small coccygeus muscle behind, and the much larger and more important levator ani muscle in front. Here's the coccygeus muscle. It runs from the ischial spine to the edge of the lower sacrum and coccyx. Coccygeus is a vestigial muscle with no demonstrable function. Now we'll add the levator ani muscle to the picture. Here's the levator ani. The levator ani has a line of origin that's partly bone and partly fascia. In front it arises from the body of the pubis. Behind it arises from the ischial spine. Between these two bony origins it arises from the tendinous arch in the fascia that overlies obturator internus. The fibers of levator ani pass downwards, backwards and medially to meet in the midline with those of the opposite side, as we'll see shortly. Let's go round to the back to see the underside of levator ani.
Here's the ischial tuberosity. Here's the sacrotuberous ligament. The space between these structures and the underside of the levator ani is called the ischiorectal fossa. In the living body, it's filled with fat. The levator ani is described as having a number of parts, which are named as though they were separate muscles. Unfortunately, the names of these parts are somewhat irrational. This part of levator ani is known as iliocoxygeus. Iliocoxygeus is very thin. This part is pubococcygeus. It's much more substantial. Pubococcygeus is subdivided further in ways that we won't go into. Now that we've looked at one levator ani muscle, let's look at the two of them together. We're looking from above. Here's the upper part of obturator internus. Here's the tendinous arch. The ischial spines are here. Here's the tip of the coccyx. Here are the coccygeus muscles. Here are the two levator ani muscles. Between them, in front, there's a gap, the urogenital hiatus, through which pass the rectum, the urethra, and, in the female, the vagina. The fibers of levator ani, which arise more posteriorly, unite in the midline with this fibrous band, the anococcygeal ligament. The fibers which arise more anteriorly form a loop which passes around the back of the urogenital hiatus. Some fibers along the edge of the hiatus attach to the sides of the rectum, the urethra, and in the female, the vagina. We'll add the urethra and the rectum to the picture. Here's the lowest part of the rectum. Here's the urethra, with the lowest part of the prostate in front of it. We'll see these structures in volume five of this atlas. The levator ani and coccygeus muscles are covered over by this dense layer of pelvic fascia, which completes the pelvic diaphragm on the inside. The pelvic diaphragm supports the pelvic organs and closes off the pelvic outlet while allowing passage for the rectum, vagina, and urethra. When we're upright, the levator ani muscles are in a constant state of tonic contraction, which becomes greater or less in response to changes in abdominal pressure. The main action of the levator ani muscles is to keep a set of downwardly mobile structures, the pelvic organs, constantly in one place. In addition, vigorous contraction of the levator ani muscles pulls the lower end of the rectum upwards and forwards. Now that we've seen the intact pelvic diaphragm from above, let's look at it from behind and from beneath. Here are the ischial tuberosities. Here's the tip of the coccyx. Here are the sacrotuberous ligaments. Here are the two levator ani muscles. This is the ischiococcygeus part. This is pubococcygeus. Here's the urogenital hiatus. Here's the anococcygeal ligament. The levator ani muscles are continuous on the underside with this cone-shaped sleeve of muscle, the external anal sphincter which maintains closure of the anus. Here's the opening of the anus. The external anal sphincter is tethered to the anococcygeal ligament by its most posterior fibers. In front, here's the divided urethra. The muscle surrounding it is the bulbospongiosus. Till now, we've been looking at the pelvic diaphragm in a dissection of a male body. Here's a similar dissection of the pelvic diaphragm of a female body. The overall structure of the female pelvic diaphragm is the same as the male, except that the pelvic diaphragm is also traversed by the vagina. Here's the opening of the urethra.
the whole region between the coccyx, the ischial tuberosities, and the pubic symphysis is called the perineum. The area between the ischiopubic rami is the urogenital triangle. We'll look at the important structures of the urogenital triangle in volume 5 of this atlas. We've been looking from behind at an isolated dissection of the pelvic diaphragm with everything else removed. To get a more complete view of where we are, we'll now add the main surrounding structures to the picture. To see the pelvic diaphragm clearly, we've been looking at an unnaturally empty pair of ischiorectal fossae. In the living body, the ischiorectal fossa is filled with fat, which is traversed by nerves and vessels, as we'll see. Here are the sacrotuberous ligaments. Here are the ischial tuberosities. Here are piriformis and obturator internus, going to their insertions on the femur, along with the gemelli and quadratus femoris. Here's the sciatic nerve, emerging below piriformis. Here's gluteus medius. Here are the origins of the hamstring muscles. Here's the line of origin of gluteus maximus, which we'll add to the picture. The lower edge of gluteus maximus covers up the ischiorectal fossa when seen from behind. On the inside, the walls of the pelvic cavity are covered with a layer of loose connective tissue, which is lined in part by peritoneum. We'll see this in a minute when we move on to look at the blood vessels and nerves of the region. Before we do that, let's review what we've seen of the pelvic muscles. Here's piriformis. Here's obturator internus. Here's the tendinous arch. Here's coccygeus. Here's the levator ani. This part is iliococcygeus. This part is pubococcygeus. Now, we'll move on to look at the blood vessels and then the nerves of the pelvis and perineum. First, the blood vessels. Here's the pelvic cavity, seen from above, with the abdominal and pelvic organs removed and the soft tissue lining of the cavity intact. The pelvic cavity is lined, somewhat irregularly, with peritoneum. Beneath that, there's a layer of pelvic fascia that's continuous with the endo-abdominal fascia. The internal iliac artery, which we saw in the last section, is hidden just under here. To see the pelvic blood vessels, we'll remove one half of the pelvis and go round to a medial view. We'll also remove the lining of peritoneum and pelvic fascia. In this dissection, the veins which follow the arteries closely have been removed to simplify the picture. The arteries of the pelvic region are all branches of the internal iliac artery. The way they arise is quite variable. This is the superior gluteal artery. This is the inferior gluteal. They pass through the greater sciatic foramen to supply the buttock region. This is the internal pudendal artery, which we'll return to in a minute. This is the obturator artery, passing forwards into the obturator canal, along with the obturator nerve. The most anterior branch of the internal iliac comes to a blind end. In the fetus, it's the umbilical artery. Branches to the pelvic organs arise in a widely varying fashion. These are the divided ends of the vesicle arteries, superior and inferior, which supply the bladder. This is the middle rectal artery, which supplies the lower part of the rectum. In the female, the uterine arteries also arise, directly or indirectly, from the internal iliac. The branch of the internal iliac that concerns us most closely here is the internal pudendal artery. It supplies the blood supply to the perineum. To reach the perineum, the internal pudendal artery goes out through the greater sciatic foramen 
around the sacrospinous ligament and back in through the lesser sciatic foramen. In this way, the internal pudendal artery ends up below the pelvic diaphragm. To follow its course, we'll go round to the back. The gluteal vessels and the sciatic nerve have been removed. Here's the internal pudendal artery emerging below piriformis. It passes behind the sacrospinous ligament, which is here, and behind this small muscle, the superior gemellus. The internal pudendal artery runs downwards and forwards along the medial aspect of obturator internus. Its branches supply the anal sphincter, the pelvic diaphragm, the external genital structures in the female, and the penis in the male. Now that we've looked at the blood vessels, we'll look at the principal nerves of the pelvic region. We'll look at the sacral plexus, then at the pudendal nerve, then at the autonomic nerves of the region. Here's the sacral plexus. Its lower part lies on the front of the piriformis muscle. The sacral plexus is formed mainly by the anterior primary rami of the spinal nerves S1 through S4. In addition, the plexus receives a contribution from L4 and 5 through this big nerve bundle, the lumbosacral trunk. The major branches of the sacral plexus leave the pelvis by passing through the greater sciatic foramen, either above piriformis or below it. Almost all the nerves that arise from the sacral plexus go to the lower extremity. They're shown in volume two of this atlas. The branches of the sacral plexus that do concern us here are the pudendal nerve, which is the principal nerve of the perineum, and also the small motor nerves to the pelvic diaphragm. A small branch or branches from S3 or 4 supply most of the levator ani muscle and the coccygeus muscle on their pelvic surfaces. Here's the pudendal nerve. It's derived from S2, 3, and 4. It arises from the plexus just above the sacrospinous ligament, which is here, and passes immediately through the greater sciatic foramen. To see where it goes, we'll go round to the back. Here's the pudendal nerve again. Here, next to it, is the internal pudendal artery, which we've already met. We'll go to an underneath view to follow the pudendal nerve. It passes forwards on the side of obturator internus along with the internal pudendal artery. Its branches supply the anal sphincter, the muscles of the urogenital diaphragm, and the external genitals. Lastly, we'll look at the autonomic nerves of the pelvic region. The autonomic nerves in the pelvis that belong to the sympathetic nervous system are the tail end of the sympathetic trunk and the so-called hypogastric nerve. The parasympathetic nerves in the pelvis are the pelvic splanchnic nerves. All these nerves, sympathetic and parasympathetic, are connected to a diffuse and extensive plexus of autonomic nerves called the pelvic plexus. The pelvic plexus lies within the fascia that covers this part of the pelvic wall and floor. A small part of the pelvic plexus has been partially dissected out here. The pelvic plexus distributes the sympathetic and parasympathetic supply to the distal colon, the pelvic organs, and the external genital organs. Feeding into the pelvic plexus from above is the hypogastric nerve, single here but often taking the form of several small nerves. It's the distal continuation of the aortic plexus. Here's the distal end of the sympathetic trunk. It enters the pelvis deep to the common iliac vessels and descends just medial to the sacral foramina. It gives rami communicantes to the anterior rami of the sacral nerves. Lastly, here are the pelvic splanchnic nerves, sometimes called the nervi erigentes. These are the source of all parasympathetic innervation in this region. They arise in this case from S3, also often from S2 and S4. They break up into branches which enter the pelvic plexus 
From the plexus, their fibers are distributed to the pelvic organs and external genitals. Now, let's review what we've seen of the blood vessels and nerves of the pelvic region. Here's the internal iliac artery, the superior gluteal and inferior gluteal arteries, the obturator artery, the ends of the cycle vessels, the middle rectal artery, the start of the pudendal artery, and its further course. Now the nerves. Here's the sacral plexus and the lumbosacral trunk. Here's the pudendal nerve from the inside and from behind. Here's the area of the pelvic plexus. Here's the hypogastric nerve, the sympathetic trunk, and the pelvic splanchnic nerves. That brings us to the end of this section on the pelvis and also to the end of volume three of the Video Atlas of Human Anatomy.